uh, today's lecture. In the last lecture, we essentially, and in your homework, you essentially learned that if you have a Gaussian prior and you multiply it times a Gaussian likelihood and normalize, you get a Gaussian posterior. Okay. So, and, and moreover, that, that Gaussian posterior, uh, its, its statistics correspond to the statistics of things that we've studied before. In particular, the mean of the posterior um, gives you back um, the rich regression estimate, and for when delta is zero, when the regularization coefficient vanishes, that takes you back to <coughs> linear regression. The alternative to doing it this way is to do it the optimization way, which you write the log likelihood or the penalized likelihood, and you differentiate and equate to zero. So to do machine learning and arrive at the same answer, we have two ways. We can go by the optimization channel, which involves writing the log likelihood, differentiating, equating to zero, and when you cannot equate to zero, following gradients, as we will see later in the course. Or alternatively, you can just use this, the fact that we know some integrals out there, and then just multiply the prior times the Gaussian, rearrange terms so that the posterior still looks like the prior. And that's essentially the basis of conjugate analysis. So we did an example of conjugate analysis, which, in your, which I asked you to do in your homework, mainly because it's the sort of thing that in a lecture is very dry, and when you do it in your homework, you actually learn to do it properly, because you get to do it. Um, uh, but, but that picture sort of captures everything. Um, if you have a Gaussian prior, you multiply it times a Gaussian likelihood, the answer is that the green curve, the posterior. And the green curve is sort of like the prior, and sort of like the likelihood. Okay, so it's in between. Um, the prior, typically, your prior knowledge is very vague, so you have a much fatter Gaussian. Um, your likelihood tends to be picked where the data is. And so whenever you get uh, measurements, um, you get this likelihood, your posterior essentially becomes more concentrated. So your knowledge of the same data um, is, uh, has higher information. So uh, more information means less uncertainty. So the tails of the Gaussian get uh, the Gaussian gets narrower and its tails go down quicker. And and the rest is just algebra. It's taking um, you take a Gaussian, you multiply it times another Gaussian, and that's what we did in this long exercise. Uh, we took this the Gaussian likelihood for linear regression, we multiplied it by a Gaussian prior, and and there was this very tedious exercise of completing squares. And what we find in the end is that the posterior um, ends up having the, uh, this expression here, which is still unnormalized. Um, but the important thing is that because we know the normalization of um, the exponent of a quadratic, and we know it because that comes from the formula of a Gaussian distribution, it's possible to derive it too. Um, I haven't asked you to derive it. Um, it's a few, it's one page of algebra to, the, to actually derive that integral from first principles. Um, uh, but for now, I assume I've given you the expression for a Gaussian, as I will always. And so, if you know the expression for Gaussian, you know it's normalizing constant. So you know how the integral works. And if we know how the integral works, that means we know what the posterior is. Because we know what we must put here, so that this whole expression sums to one. Okay, so the game, as the picture here says, is you take the green curve, you multiply it times the blue curve. Okay? So if you think of a function as a vector with many entries, you're just multiplying two vectors. And then you're just making sure that that vector, the resulting vector, you normalize that vector to make sure that it sums to one. Okay? So that's the basic operation. Okay. Yeah. What happens if you don't know the prior? Would you just take a uniform distribution? Right, so in some cases, we, we will choose a prior that uh, will not give us, uh, with the likelihood, it's not going to be conjugate. So we're not going to know the integral. 
when we don't know the integral, we're going to have to introduce numerical techniques for solving the integral. So later in the course, we'll get to it. Uh, I'm going to introduce Monte Carlo methods and how we solve the integral. But there is this class of distributions like Gaussians that we just love. And the reason why we love them is because we can solve the integral with Gaussians. It's one of those few integrals we can do by hand. Um, those are very precious. And it's one of the reasons why people use Gaussian distributions to model data all the time, because the, it's, they're easy to manipulate. They're the easiest models you can come up with for real data. And that's essentially gives us the expression for the posterior. Um, and then in your homework, I ask you to do uh, the same thing for the variance, to estimate the variance. And I gave you the, price, the, the, the prior for variances, which is the inverse uh, Wishart prior. And then again, if you multiply the inverse Wishart number the Gaussian likelihood, the expression you would get also looks like an inverse Wishart. And because you know the normalization constant, because um, for all these standard distributions, we know the normalization constants, um, then it's, again, a very simple exercise to derive the posterior of the, of the <coughs> distribution of um, big sigma in this case. And, and if you have the posterior for the covariance uh, big sigma, then you, by choosing the prior parameters to certain values, you get the maximum likelihood estimate, which was the other thing I asked you to do in your homework. So um, you've done it for big sigma. I did it for theta in class. And in fact, for any model, the, the, the mechanics is always the same. You have a prior, you multiply times the likelihood. If you can do, if you know the integral, you can do this thing called conjugate analysis, which is, and then you get a, an expression for the posterior. And then when you change the parameters of that prior, um, you recover the maximum likelihood estimates. Okay. And, and in particular, um, if we consider a prior that is zero mean, so if the prior is zero mean, and let's say that for the variance we use, uh, we introduce this quantity tau square, it's just a positive scalar, um, then one can show that by introducing this parameter lambda, which is just a reparameterization to make it a bit more clean, of sigma divided by tau naught, and if um, and if sigma, and where sig, small sigma is as, as in this expression, is the same model. So with that likelihood, but just a slightly different version of the prior, then the expression for the posterior mean simplifies to the rich regression estimate, <coughs> right? So now, if we make the prior very flat, so we have our likelihood, but if we take a prior, which is a Gaussian that's very, very flat, that it has a very high variance, if it has a very high variance, then your tau naught, which is its, if it has a very high variance, this is sort of, because tau naught is very large, so going to infinity. But if tau naught goes to infinity, lambda goes to zero. And if lambda goes to zero, we get maximum likelihood. And this makes perfectly sense. If your prior is very flat, that means you really don't know what's the most likely location of your theta. You basically are saying, I don't know, by making that prior flat, so nearly uniform. And if you don't know, if your prior doesn't have information, then you should get back the answer implied by the likelihood. Okay. And that's really nice thing about the Bayesian framework is it allows us to recover the sort of the, 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 the usual common sense estimators just based on the date. All right, so now I'm going to go just give you without proof. Well, actually, we did prove one part. 
um, a very useful theorem. It's from KPM's book. Uh, I should say Kevin <coughs> Murphy. So it's from the textbook that I recommend for this course. Um, if you want a full proof. But essentially, the theorem says that if you have a Gaussian P of X, a marginal, in a conditional P of Y given X of this form, then the posterior, so in other words, P of X given Y, the posterior being equal to P of Y given X, the likelihood times the prior, And this is a general theorem for any x for any y. So don't confuse this y and this x with the ones for linear regression. This is just a general theorem for two variables y and x. For any two variables y and x, the posterior p of x given y um, always admits this particular expression. So if I had given you this theorem, um, you wouldn't have done any completing squares. Because when you did completing squares, what you did is you did a specific variation of this theorem. That's what you proved. So you proved this first. Um, you proved box two. Okay, so this proof we did. One proof that we didn't do was the second box, which is something called convolution. And convolution, um, I'm saying it's convolution because essentially in order to get P of Y, what we do is we integrate of a, a, a dummy variable X prime, P of Y given X prime times P of X prime DX prime. Okay. So it's very similar to the operation of convolution if we've seen it in signal processing. But all I'm saying is if you take two Gaussians, multiply, and then you sum over um, the variable x, um, the expression for p of y will always be of this form. Okay? I think I might give you that as a homework exercise later. May or may not, because uh, honestly, you don't learn much of doing that exercise other than to manipulate Gaussian distributions. Um, if you're serious about machine learning or data mining or if you, you want to do something for your PhD that involves machine learning, then I really strongly recommend you do this derivation. And it's all in, it's in chapter four of Kevin's book. It gets really tedious, so I don't want to do it in class. Um, but once you have, we've proved the first part and once you have the second part, you can pretty much do everything with Gaussian. So in fact, if you just remember now this theorem, just keep it in a piece of paper or whatever, whenever you have to do this, get the posterior for a Gaussian distribution, you're not going to have to do the completing squares again by hand. Just basically follow this recipe. Now, the reason why I'm talking about convolution is because um, that allows us to do prediction. So we know that we have expressions for the posterior mean and for the posterior variance we've derived. Um, but now if I use the expression of the multiplication of two Gaussians integrated uh, out, that is the convolution operation, um, just by applying the theorem in the previous page, I get this expression for the predictive distribution. If you want to make a prediction, um, in other words, given a new x, x star, I want to generate a prediction of why y should be. Given my data, which includes all the training data, x, y's, then for Bayesians, the way to make a prediction is you take, is essentially you marginalize out the parameters or if, if you will, for each possible value of theta, your prediction is weighted by the posterior. So it's a weighted prediction. If there were three 
and it's weighted by an infinite number of thetas because uh, the integral is over all, the whole domain of theta. But essentially, the frequentists to make a prediction just use the likelihood, right? Because I told you if you want to make a prediction when you do least squares, you just take the new x multiply times theta that gives you your prediction. And then the uncertainty is just essentially sigma. But this is saying that let's not just use this, but let's rather weight each theta gets weighted by its posterior probability. Okay, so it's an ensemble predictor. And if we want to do the, if we apply the theorem in the previous page, we get this expression here. So in contrast to the ML as the prediction, the ML prediction was just to take x times theta and have the same variance. The Bayesian way, so the, the ML basically assumes there is one single theta. If there was a, in other words, what the ML guys are doing, and note this is true, this, the, this, this integral there is just P of y given x minus theta times P of theta. Um, and so I'm just integrating out theta. So that by the rules of probability, th there's no approximations or anything. That's just uh, exact application of marginalization. The frequentists approximate this because essentially what they do is they replace this integral by a Gaussian and y given x theta comma sigma squared. And then they use a delta function at theta ml, p theta. Okay, the delta function is just a spike at one value. This delta function is also called the Dirac function or the impulse function, as engineers call it. And one of the properties of the Dirac function is if you do an integration um, with respect to the Dirac function, you essentially just pick the theta ml. In other words, if I were to multiply a Gaussian times a spike, then it would be zero everywhere except where the spike is. And at that point, it would be the value of the Gaussian. Um, and that's why that integral simplifies to this expression here at the bottom. OK, because there's frequencies assume there's only one true theta. There's only one theta. Bayesians always assume there's an infinite number of thetas. And you should weight each prediction by that value of theta. So the implication of this uh, is that um, the theta n, the posterior theta, the theta ml, um, they might not be that different. The, the, you know, the, the theta ridge and the theta maximum likelihood often in practice can be quite similar, except for numerical computing issues. Um, however, an important thing is this term. Note that both expressions have the same sigma. But in the Bayesian scheme, there's a new term that appears. And that term has the, the new input data, x. And it has this matrix V, which is sort of um, the inverse of something that has to do with the data, the training data, x transpose x. The effect of that extra term is as follows. Your frequentist estimates always have the same width. And that width is sigma squared. Because we said there was the same sigma, and that sigma applied to every point. Okay? And so each point, if we look at it marginally, if this is x and this is y, each point is distributed according to a Gaussian distribution. Just, this is still the regression. However, that extra term that the Bayesians give us 
that extra x x star um, vn x star term let me make sure I get the right transpose will ensure that where we have data so this would be these bars here where we have data because now the, the height of the bars is data dependent where we have data those bars will be narrow where we don't have data those bars will be high in other words if we know that there's data in one part of the space we are confident of our estimate but where we don't have data, we should not be confident. Maximum likelihood fails quite badly in this regard because the estimator is as confident here as it is here. And that doesn't make sense. So that's sort of important. If you care about confidence intervals, you want to be